um, as I mentioned earlier, my name is Jennifer Dale. I'm the program manager for the renewable portfolio at Energy Efficiency Alberta. That includes the residential and commercial solar program, as well as uh, some community energy capacity building program, and some future and community energy programs that will come. So just a bit about Energy Efficiency Alberta. So we're a crown corporation that was uh, derived out of the climate leadership plan. And our mandate is to raise awareness about energy conservation, promote design and deliver programs, and to promote the development of an energy efficiency and renewable services industry. We have several different programs available in the market today that are promoting energy efficiency for homeowners and businesses, as well as, as uh, renewable energy. So here's just a snapshot of some of the programs that are marketed today. So we have many, many energy efficiency programs that help people um, save energy in their homes and help businesses save energy in facilities and also nonprofits to save energy in their facilities as well. And of course, their residential and commercial solar program. And soon to be available are financing program offerings that will be available shortly in the, early in the new year. So we've had a really big year. So our first uh, year of operation was the 2017-2018 fiscal year. So our fiscal year ends March 31st. And I just want to share a few a snapshot of some of the results. So based on our 2017-2018 fiscal year, we, uh, we did a full analysis of our program results using third parties. And we discovered that um, for th every three dollars, for every dollar invested, three dollars was just returned in terms of investing in energy efficiency and renewable energy projects for homeowners and businesses. And another interesting fact is that we had 100% participation in, in all of the province which means every single postal code in Alberta participated in at least one of our programs. And we also, the results also show that about 2,300 jobs have been created uh, based on the uptake in our energy efficiency and renewable energy program. So I just want to quickly go over the goals of our program. So our program was launched in 2017. Um, as I mentioned, it came out of the Climate Leadership Plan. So the residential and commercial solar program's goals are to reach 48 megawatts installed capacity by March 2021. So that's installed capacity of microgeneration, so homes, rooftop solar, and commercial solar. Another one of our goals is to increase capacity in the renewable energy sector in the province and to raise awareness of renewable energy and how you can access it as a homeowner or a business. And one of our, our goals that we we're really passionate about working on in the future is supporting the alignment of the solar installer trading and certification in the province so that we can create a clear pathway for people wanting to enter the industry and get involved in uh, the technical side of solar. We've done several different things to increase capacity in renewable energy in the province since in the past 12 months. We've, we've funded several different training initiatives that's provided training for electrical sectors for, and for electricians to help uh, them be more aware of solar PV and how it works. So this is a, the summary of our current incentive structure that is offered in the Residential Commercial Solar Program. So as you'll note, it's, re, it's been recently changed. So as of November 7, 2018, we increased the incentives for all sectors. So residential went from 75 cents a watt to 90 cents a watt. And it went uh, from 30% to 35% of total system cost. But the cap on that incentive was still, it was remains at $10,000. For commercial and institutional participants, uh, we kept the dollar per watt the same, but we increased the cap to 35% uh, of the total system cost, or $1 million, whichever is reached first. And for nonprofits and charities who, who, who um, realize the greatest barrier to entry in terms of getting involved with solar, we've raised the incentive from 75 cents a watt to a dollar per watt, and the caps to 35% of the total system cost, $1 million. So there's a, an example at the bottom, uh, for a commercial example, um, for a 150 kilowatt system. So it's basically the lesser of the per watt uh, incentive uh, versus the 35%. So that's how that works. The reason that we changed it was because it was driven by feedback from industry. We learned that our incentive levels were not sufficient to allow for larger commercial projects and, and non-profit projects in the market. I just want to touch on quickly the eligibility criteria to, to obtain the residential commercial solar program incentive. 
So it's important to know that all projects must be microgeneration compliant. So the microgeneration regulation is a regulation that exists in Alberta that requires your project to be grid connected and less than five megawatts in size. There's some other, you see there's other things uh, in the microgeneration regulation, but those are the things that come up the most. <coughs> it also has to be installed by a sort of, well, I want to say, by an installer that is on our directory. So to, to be on the directory, you have to be a member of CISA and to sign the code of conduct. And that makes you eligible as an installer to participate in our program. So just here's a few results of the residential commercial solar programs. We're prepared about two weeks ago. So, it, and it changes every day because we get new applicants every single day. But about that two weeks ago, there was around 1,400 um, applicants in the program. And there's 120, uh, 1,024 completed residential systems, totaling just over 70 megawatts. And 53 completed commercial systems, totaling 3.5 megawatts, and seven nonprofit systems. So the, as you can see, the nonprofit participation was low, but which is one of the reasons, one of the drivers for increasing incentive for that sector. Um, the average cost that we're seeing out there in the market is about two to three, two dollars to three fifty uh, per watt for installed cost. And there are total megawatts achieved to date is about eleven. Two weeks ago, eleven point seven, so we're over twelve megawatts at this point today. And I also want to mention that we have another 33 megawatts in the queue. So in the pipeline for projects that will be funded in the next 18 months, mm -hmm. which will bring us to our goals by March 2021. This is the distribution of projects that we are installed projects in the province. I'm not sure if you can see that, but the, uh, down there is Metro Edmonton area, and the large building was the Calgary Metro area. So Calgary and Edmonton are having similar levels of participation in the, in the solar program. So about, say, just over 50% of participation in the province in total is, has occurred in those two cities. But many rural areas throughout Alberta have participated. And the most northern installation has been in Fort Vermillion. And we've had over 150 municipalities in Alberta have participated in the solar program. And about 120 installers have completed at least one project. So the reach has been quite, quite vast throughout the province. So that's, that's an overview of the Residential Commercial Solar Program. I also am going to talk a little bit about uh, a new initiative of uh, community generation, which some of you may have heard of. So um, last week, I believe, the uh, Minister, uh, Minister Phillips announced the small, that there will be a new regulation coming into force, the small scale generation regulation, which will come into force on January 1st, 2019. And this regulation defines small scale and community generation. It defines the eligibility. So it, in addition to the, the regulation being released, there will be a community generation program available in the future. This was announced on November 22nd by the Royal Municipalities Association Commission in, in Edmonton by the Minister Phillips. The Community Generation Program is providing 200 million over 20 years, which is going to be in the form of competitive contract for differences for projects that are able to participate in this program. So the criteria, eligibility criteria, and the way that it's going to roll out is undefined at this point. And there'll be up to 150 million for projects supporting full-funded communities specifically out of this. Uh, particular program. And along with the capacity building, uh, along with the program, there'll be some capacity building activities um, happening in the province soon. So this is going to start with a what, what we're calling a roadshow. There'll be open houses and a dozen communities in early 2019. So that's basically to go th throughout Alberta to provide to raise awareness on community generation and the associated program and how communities can get involved. The government is also going to be establishing a community generation, generation hotline that will be a dedicated line that, pe that those interested parties can call to get more information about the program and the regulation and how they can participate. And there's really, there is an online resource hub available right now, which was launched last week by Energy Efficiency Alberta on our website. 
and that will provide access to regulatory information and any other information that becomes available. So that will be the go-to place for information on any changes in the community generation space. And in partnership with the, uh, the, Alberta, the Municipal Climate Change Action Center, Energy Efficiency Alberta will be undertaking capacity building efforts in early 2019 to help provide financial and technical support to communities in preparation for participating in long-term community generation program when it launches in fall of 2019. So we'll be collaborating with NCCAC to provide a program where it will be likely a grant-based program where we, uh, similar to the capacity building program that we had in this past year that will be accepting proposals for different activities that will build capacity in the province. Is there any questions? On the community generation, is there any carbon for solar or is it wind and solar or biomass? Everybody could be against Everybody can be, yeah. And why, what was the rationale for this building? They wanted to include all renewable, renewable energy, uh, renewable alternative energy uh, based on the Renewable Energy Act. So wind, hydro, sustainable biomass, geothermal is also in there. So renewable energy. Hi, uh, can you uh, speak to the alignment of solar training and certification? This is an initiative that is in really early phases. Uh, so we, we're working with uh, CANSIA to uh, basically initiate a study on what the needs are in the province in terms of what's available right now um, to those interested in, in participating in the industry. What do people have, what's working, and what is not. And the results of that study will inform basically a roadmap on what where we're going to go with that and what we're going to support. So basically the idea is, and it's based on feedback from the installer community, is that there isn't any go-to place for certification that's less recognized the market um, universally. So that's kind of what, what our goals are with that. So are you looking to uh, kind of pull the scope of work of the solar installation away from electricians doing the installation? No, no, okay. no, it's just, is it, I'm, I'm not sure. Of electrician certification? Or? It would likely require that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, it's going to be compliant to the uh, trade regulations currently. But I guess our vision is to having something that is a certification that is recognized in the market, so that you can, so that consumers will be able to have trust and be able to look for this certification when they're looking to hire somebody. So can you give a little better description of what the community generation program is? So the community generation program is right now defined as the $200 million contract for differences program that will be available in the future, so in fall 2019. So that's basically what's being defined as the program right now. So what so is the program? That, that's the program. It'll be competitive intake of projects similar to the REP, if you're familiar with the REP program. Okay. So that's, I think that's the vision, uh, to have it similar to the REP, but it'll be smaller scale projects. So you compete um, with other projects for these contracts for differences. So you have a 20 year guaranteed price in the project, which makes more of the projects viable. And the second question is, on, on all these government programs, is there any uh, provision for who owns the carbon credits of any from any of these programs? So for the residential and commercial solar program, Energy Efficiency Alberta, or the government of Alberta, owns the environment, the environmental attributes for the projects that we fund. So they own the car. They do, so. yes. Have you noticed any difference in uptake since Edmonton implemented their solar rebate system on top of the Energy Efficiency Alberta one? Um, yeah, good question. So, as uh, those of you don't know, uh, Ed, the city of Edmonton launched their own solar incentive program called, I think it's called Change for Climate, uh, back in June of 2018. So they are offering 15 cents um, on top of our 75 cents, which is now 90, but uh, they were offering uh, basically a top up to all Edmonton residents. So it was a residential program only for those people who wanted to get uh, so rooftop solar. So yes, there has been an increase in uptake and everything due to that program. I wouldn't say it's been significant because there was already a significant uptake in, in Edmonton, particularly in, um, with respect to residential solar. So this has basically continued the trend. And do you think that then you would see, you would observe in the future a difference between uh, Edmonton and Calgary, given that the baseline would be the charts you showed 
Edmonton and Calgary competing in the same proportion? I'm not too sure. So right now, Edmonton and Calgary are very similar. Edmonton and Calgary obviously have more people. So, you know, there's been um, a lot of uptake in Calgary, especially in the past six months. So they've been big, big, pretty even, I would say, in the last uh, six to 12 months. Thank you. Sure. So um, with respect to the the, uh, the, the solar program, um, well, we, we have a category of nonprofits, as, as I mentioned, and uh, we weren't seeing very much uptake in the nonprofit uh, sector uh, through so since the program inception, which was which was <coughs> it was mid 2017. Obviously, nonprofits have less money to spend on things like solar installations, so we weren't expecting uh, you know, the uptake to be that large, but we wanted to support them even more, which is why we brought the incentive level up to a dollar per watt, which I think will help enable projects go forward for those uh, organizations. So uh, the, the, um, all, the pro all the projects have to be connected to the grid? Right? Correct. Okay. To get the incentive. Get the incentive. Yeah. There is no no program for off grid. There is no program for off grid. No. And what's the reason behind? It? So the reason they are they don't get an incentive uh, in the solar program is because our program must be compliant to the microgen regulation. That is how it was created. Um, okay. Yeah, and the microgen regulation requires that installations be grid connected. Now, I don't know the deep philosophical reason for that, but that's the way it is. Okay. Yeah. No, but it's <laughs> curious because it's not catering to the other section of society. No, I agree. So I agree. I and it's, it's been curious. something that's been a bit of a thorn in my side, I think. I would say that I would like to offer the program to off grid participants very strongly, but I haven't been able to uh, break the connection to the regulation. I installed solar on my roof last July, and now the incentive has gone up, <laughs> which personally is nearly seven hundred dollars a week. Is there any way I can take part in the new program? So there's a few ways you can you can participate. So if you are able to and wishing to expand your solar system. Uh, you can take advantage of the incentive level. Um, also, it, all the past participants uh, were offered a incentive in the Home Energy Plan program, which is currently available in the market. So you would have got an email from us uh, offering uh, a $400 incentive uh, in the Home Energy Plan program. And that was if I was to upgrade my furnace and my windows, yeah, so which I've already done. Eligible upgrades. So there's a number of things that are eligible in that program. So air sealing, furnaces, hot water tanks, uh, windows, as you mentioned. Uh, what else is there? General water heat recovery. And in the um, there's two streams of home energy plan program. There's the standard stream that you do an initial home energy audit, and you don't have to do the follow up one. And also there's like. Um, Descriptive measures that you can do, and then there's the custom stream where you, you have to do a, a key and post audit, and you can do many different things at your home, and then the incentive is based on your energy savings, based on the, in the two evaluations. So we realized there would be some unhappy customers out there for sure. We definitely took that into consideration, um, but it was it was too difficult for us to. It would be very difficult for us to uh, retroactively fund projects. Because it's there's a the evaluation would um, lose a lot of energy savings in an evaluation in that circumstance. So that was not feasible for us. So this was one way of sort of thanking everybody for their participation and hopefully offering them something else that they could get even deeper energy savings in their home. And as the regulation matures and the market penetration increases. Um, are the safety codes keeping up? Like you all see, as well as um, you know, the Canadian Fire Alarm Association. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing that there's more scrutiny just to make sure that public safety is uh, kept in That's a good question. I can't say I, I, I know the answer to that. 
uh, about if the public safety uh, measures are keeping up with the pace of the solar installation happening in, in the province. I say what what we did do to help um, to mitigate risk in that area was offer the training to electrical inspectors so that they can identify any areas of safety concern better uh, for photovoltaic systems because not every not every inspector in the province has, has encountered one and it might be that it might be the first time they see one so we're hoping that that would be helpful um, so that's one thing that we're, we're doing uh, to, to support that but in terms of if it's going to be I'm not too sure I would uh, maybe get in touch with the Safety Board Council or the Electrical Contractors Association. True or not, when I heard that firefighters that encounter a home burning with solar panels mm -hmm. will just let it burn because they're scared of the DC voltage. Right. I, I'm, I'm not a firefighter myself, but I can speak to you. a portion of the firefighting industry of the province here. My daddy works for the uh, CFD, and that's completely false. They're not going to not fight a fire in a home just because there's solar on the roof. So uh, that's completely false. I have no idea where that's from. Okay, well thank you very much for having me today and enjoy the rest of the evening. Our next speaker, Paul Garibald, has over 20 years of experience in the energy industry in North America, primarily in the renewable sector. Paul is the co-founder of Solus Energy Consulting. Her experience includes project management, climate change analysis, business development, and strategic planning. Paula was previously the head of Shell Wind Energy for Canada. She also started up Suncor's Alternative and Renewable Energy Group. Paula's academic background includes two undergraduate degrees from the University of Alberta, a Bachelor of Science in Biology and Chemistry, and another in Chemical Engineering. And in addition, she holds an MBA in Finance from Queen's University. Paula is a member of APEGA, as well as CANWIA and CANSIA, the Canadian Wind and Solar Energy uh, Associations. And <laughs> Thank you. Uh, she was invited by the British High Commission to work on sustainability as part of the 2002 G8 Summit. And she's also been a participant in the National Roundtable on Energy and the Environment, NRT. Please welcome with me and make it a warm welcome for Paul Laguerre. This is a study that we did uh, like how we spent my summer vacation. Uh, so we started this, I think, in May, and it's all about Alberta solar PV value opportunities. We were awarded the work from CISA, and uh, this work was done with multiple people that worked on it. Uh, whole productivity was involved as well. I have to do the customary disclaimer. Excuse me, just look at that after. So in terms of the overall purpose, it was really to identify what the value chain opportunity is. How big is it? Is it $100 million? Is it $10 million? How big is it? The second one is, well, how much can we capture of the value chain? Third one is, what are the jobs? How many jobs? Could there be jobs? Is it 10 jobs? Is it 200 jobs? How many jobs? And then also, what's the training opportunities? What's, what's here in Alberta and is there any gaps? So in terms of what is the value chain, the value chain is really about the activities associated in the industry that bring about a product or a service. And for us, it's really about delivering electricity through solar. Um, so we did not look at a building integrated PV, uh, we looked at conventional solar PV, and we did not look at energy storage, but essentially we looked at all aspects of the entire value chain around solar power. We did not do solar thermal. <laughs> so tonight we're looking at just a little bit of an introduction, look at the value chain assessment, the economic impact, the jobs, the training, what we saw as priorities that came out of this, and some of the next steps. So stepping back, um, the global solar industry, in terms of the size, the pace, is staggering. And I've, I've worked in the wind industry for a long time, but the solar industry growth rate is absolutely phenomenal. Um, so the cost has been absolutely plummeting, 86% drop in eight years. That's amazing. If you had a drop in your salary by 86% in eight years, <laughs> It'd be a cause for concern, but for this, it's, it's good, right? And then, in terms of the growth rate, an annual growth rate in the last, how many years is that? Yeah, six, 26 years is 43%. I know it started small, but it's still 43% per year it has been growing, which is absolutely amazing. So where we are now is around 300 gigawatts around the world. 
So that's about half of the deployed winds in the world. And wind was sort of earlier, and solar came in a little bit later, but solar is, is really catching up quite, quite quickly. In terms of the forecasts, uh, we looked at a lot of studies of where things are going, and essentially it said globally it's at 20% growth rate each year. If you look at oil and gas in Western Canada, we found comparables at 4 and 5%. I mean, oil and gas is still massive, mm -hmm. but solar is, is on a very fast tra trajectory, absolutely. Um, there's also a forecast of drop in the electricity from solar by 25% in the next three years. So that the levelized cost of energy. You know, somebody commented saying, hey, hang on a second, I didn't get the rebate, I only got the cheaper rebate. Uh, but Jennifer, my panels were put in without any rebates. <laughs> and they were a lot more expensive. They were a lot more expensive. That 86% decline. <laughs> yeah, I, I, mine were a lot more. Mine were probably three times, no, two times the price of a mirror now. It was worth it. In terms of Alberta, so that's global. So it's a very big industry. It's moving very quickly. So in terms of what's happening in Alberta, so you've heard about the climate leadership plans, the 30% renewable energy by 2030. Our solar resource is absolutely fabulous. We are not short on resource. Um, our resource is similar to Miami, Florida. It's similar to Rio de Janeiro. It is absolutely an amazing resource. Um, I know when I talk to friends of mine in the US, they go, like, really? No, it, it's as good. In fact, I've done some work on solar in Tehachapi, California, and uh, you know they have some degradation, or not degradation, but production decline as a result of the hotter temperatures. And because we have a lower average temperature, we actually have better production rates. Uh, because you, you, you tend to lose some production with every degree above 25 degrees Celsius. We don't have that problem. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of our market, we're small, we're mighty, but we're growing. And by June of this year, we had about 43 megawatts. ACDC, I don't know, because it's a bit of a mixed bag in terms of how people report it. Uh, we have 305 solar companies that are in the Kansia and uh, CSAT directories combined. But most of them are all on uh, rooftop deployment, so install. About 83% 83 of them support rooftop. In the ISO, so the Alberta Electric System Operator, there's 86 projects as of August. And that was 4,547 megawatts. Anybody know how many megawatts is in all of Alberta for generation at the moment? Hazard a guess. 16,000 so 16, is what we have for generating capacity. So in the queue, we have another almost 5,000 megawatts. Um, that's, that's a very large queue compared to what we have for generating capacity. Our demand is usually around um, 10 to 13,000. We have more generating capacity than we need. So. So that's, that's a lot in the queue. And then we have 16 training providers. Most of them are on residential install training, uh, but we have about, we, we tracked down 16 that we thought were, okay, these ones are credible, and there's something to do with solar or sustainability in those matters. And this is just a slide to break up the monotony of just numbers being thrown at <laughs> So this is just uh, Brook Solar. We worked on this one on regulatory aspects as well as the constraints and setbacks. And I love this one because it shows it in deployment and, uh, and how it's been constructed. Um, so this one's around 15 megawatts AC. It's funny, uh, so Solus in the US does a lot of work, um, but they only refer to, Solus, or to uh, solar in AC and not DC. And I find in Canada we tend to refer to it as DC. Um, so anyway, it's about 15 megawatts AC. It's the first distribution connected ground mount. It was by Elemental Energy in 2017. It did have some funding from um, previously called CCEMC, Climate Change Emissions Management Corporation, which is now called Emission Reductions Alberta. So it had some funding associated with that. In terms of the scope of the analysis that we did, the timeline we had was what's the value out to 2030? Um, we did rooftop solar, ground mount, and we did Alberta deployment only. We did not include, as I mentioned, building integrated, nor energy storage, nor any kind of research in the moment. So those are outside of the scope. Um, so how you do a value chain analysis is actually a little bit tricky. Um, the first thing is, is you have to figure out, well, how many megawatts are going to be deployed by 2030? And what we did is we leaned on a study that we did last year for the Canadian Solar Industry Association, where we looked at different deployment rates. 
So we chose one of the scenarios from that deployment study that identified um, historical U.S. growth rates, and it was non-linear, so it kind of went up like a bit of a curve. And so that we used that as the base to say, okay, but that's how many is deployed. But then you have to ask the question, well, how many is ground mounted, and how many is rooftop, and in what sector are they growing? And again, we leveraged that, and it's also based on historical U.S. growth rates for each of those types of sectors. The second thing is to say, well, how do I break down where the value is? How do I know how much is in um, installation versus um, development versus design work? How do I know those pieces? And what we did is we used a study, a very detailed study out of Ireland. <laughs> um, and they had just great granularity. We were able to take that and shift it and shape it into what we needed for Alberta. We do a lot of cost estimates in the US and Canada for large scale solar. So we're able to then vet it against what the costs were based on the percentage breakdowns to say, yes, this is reasonable, and to read it here and there. So it was, it was a bit of an artistic way to pull it together, but we had that foundation of the Irish study. On the cost estimation, as I mentioned, we had the information internally on the utility mm -hmm. scale, but we also then phoned some friends on the, on the rooftop and said, you know, give us a bit of a breakdown, does this make sense, does it not? So we did some litmus tests on that. The next part was then, what's the total value? Does it make sense? How is the deployment? Where is most of the value? What part of the life cycle is most of the value? And the next question is, is there jobs associated with that? We used another study, or another tool called the JEDI model, which is really cool. <laughs> and it's the Jobs and Economic Development model from the National Renewable Energy Lab in the US. And we looked at it and we vetted it internally to say, does it still work? Um, do these, are these models? So that identified the number of jobs associated with this level of deployment. The next question, which was really hard, was to say, can Alberta and Albertans and Alberta-based businesses achieve part of that value chain? And if so, what part of the value chain? And what can they do now versus what could they do later? And what parts are just not achievable by Alberta-based companies? And so there was a lot of teasing apart all of these and uh, a lot of long, detailed conversations and we try something and then we have to pull back and try it again. So it was, it was a lot of detail. So we did some simplifications because otherwise it becomes behemoth. And uh, in terms of the market segment, so we have in Alberta the microgen regulation, and under that we have residential, commercial slash industrial, and some farm. This is really about saying, this is how much energy I use, I'm going to now generate power with solar, and so it's now part of my microgen. Then we have distribution connected, which we call community, and then we have utility scale, which is essentially anything that's not distribution connected and not microgen. So we made a simplification and said, anything that's microgen is rooftop, because most of it is. Are there cases where it's not? Absolutely, but we're about the approximates and not the details. And the non-microgen, we said it's all ground mount. And so we did the value chain based on those two. So the actual deployment scenario is the following. I'm going to get a drink of water and you guys have a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So this is so it's a non-linear. This is what we've seen in the U.S. is it's not a straight line for growth rates. It's actually it's got a curve to it, and it's got a curve in a positive way where it's accelerating. Um, so we did we looked at this deployment out to 2030. It resulted in 3.2 gigawatts of uh, megawatts of uh, solar PV deployed uh, by 2030. Now today we're at 42 approximately. Maybe we're 40. We're around there. Um, so, so in 12 years or 11 years from now, we could be at this. And that is if we have followed historical U.S. growth rates. And that's not like California and New Jersey. That's an average growth rate in the U.S. So that's quite a lot. And then we have most of it is in utility scale because we found that the growth rates in the U.S. for utility were far higher than any of the other uh, market segments community, farm and commercial, and residential. And just to give you a little bit of a breakdown of what does that mean, what would that mean if I were to see this? So I'll just go to the next one. So on utility applications, you get 2081 megawatts DC, community, 389. Right now on the community definition, we have 15. So I think that's achievable. We could do that, and we have this competition coming up, so that's good. 
Um, on commercial, this would be then 7% of all commercial and industrial buildings and 1% of all farms. The farm uptake historically in the US has been low for whatever reason, and so we monitor based on that. On the residential, it would be 566 megawatts PC, or 12% of all residences. Now, in Alberta in 2016, we had 1.1 million homes. By 2030, we should have 1.6 million homes. There's an expected 22% increase in population in Alberta in that time period. And so that would result in around 180,000 homes. And I think, Jennifer, you said we have about 1,000 homes that have sold around them. This would be now 180,000 homes that have sold around them by 2030. So there's a bit of room there for market opportunities, business weapons, maybe additional people. And that's if, if the deployment is similar to the same rate that the US has seen. So now into the value chain assessments. We've divided it into six life stages. We have development, design, manufacturing. And manufacturing, we said, is everything that has to arrive that is not made on site. So anything that's off site is considered manufacturing, and anything that happens on site is called install. O and M, and then we have decommissioning. So we have all six stages of the solar PV. Now the next slide is going to be difficult to see. But that's okay, because in the report, it's the 11 by 17 in the report, and you'll be able to see it in nice, clear detail. So here's the different um, value chains. So we've got development, design, manufacturing, install, O&M, and then decommissioning. What we've done is on the O&M side, we said that that's 100% on the O&M, so that's an annual cost. And then we have the actual capital expenditure, so 1, 2, 3, and 4, add up to 100%. Then within each life stage, we have now broken it up into the different components and said, where is the percentage of the value in each of those components? So right away, if you look under manufacturing, manufacturing is almost 68%. And if you look in the balance of system, it's actually 21. Meanwhile, solar cell manufacturing is 19%. But I won't strain your eyes because I've got some flow charts there. So then we did that for rooftop, and then we did that for ground lift. And green is always ground lift, we'll put in here just so it's all the grass, and blue is just because of the sky. Because we were starting to lose our minds after a while, hang on, come on, chart. Um, so they're actually fairly simple, or similar, I should say, in the capital expenditure. So here's a comparison that on the rooftop at Solar CapEx, manufacturing is like 68% approximately for both. They're, they're really quite similar. Design work is a little more expensive on the ground lift side. Um, development is very similar, install commissioning, slightly different, slightly higher on install commissioning costs on the rooftop floor. Do we have a question from the floor? We do. Sorry, sorry. It's a, you just lost me on the last slide with something, if I could back you up. Uh, my apologies. So mm -hmm. the, the circle percentages, what is that? Like 68.7% manufacturing? So if you spent a billion dollars, say a hundred billion dollars for three years, and 68 million of the value is actually in the manufacturing. Okay, so all those numbers at the top. So the ones one through four add up to a hundred as a capital expenditure. And then there's and then we have the That's the thing I didn't get. Okay. Thank you. All right. If there's other questions, I'm really happy to take them. What is the assumption on pricing <clears throat> What of the next 12 years? That is a great question. So for, we looked at current pricing, um, and part of the issue is that, and I work with a lot of oil and gas companies, and they're, and they're used to putting escalators on things, mm -hmm. and I had to explain that we don't put escalators on solar modules, we put de-escalators on solar modules because the cost is coming down. So we actually use GCM research forecast for what the decline forecast is for the module portion of it, and it was an 8% decline year over year, and then we then we smoothed it out because it's not going to be a percent forever. Um, on the other components, we actually kept them stable or we escalated the cost over time because if you continue to decrease the cost of solar at infinity, you will have a bunch of solar modules standing on the ground in boxes and you'll have no one to install them because the cost has gone down. So it doesn't make sense. Uh, that the labor will continue and will increase. However, the efficiency of the modules will also improve, which means there's fewer to install, which means there's less acreage to do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you can wind yourself up very quickly on that, or you can take a simple approach. 
decline the marginal prices at 8% per year, keep everything the same, or escalate them at inflation. So that's what we chose to do. But when we've designed other cost estimating models for solar, because modular efficiency, like the ones on my house are 250 watts, the ones that utility scale install are 410, and so you need a lot less land in order to do mm -hmm. that, so everything kind of shrinks over time. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, that was, we're very careful. Um, the deployment rate year over year, we took that into consideration. So the modules that are deployed in 2030 are going to be cheaper than the ones that are deployed today. So that took that into consideration. Great question. Any others? Good question. <laughs> okay, so we talked about these are very similar. So most of the value is in the manufacturing. In the entire uh, value chain, it's mostly in the manufacturing life stage. There's no, depending on how much this is, this is, you could say, well, you know, it's only manufacturing, we don't do manufacturing, and we're out. Well, hang on a second, how big is this pie? And let's see how much these other pieces are. So we looked at all of the components, we looked at the costs, and we actually identified that the 3.2 gigawatt deployed by 2030 would be $4.1 billion. Okay, so the answer is, the final answer is $4.1 billion. That's pretty big. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the size of Alberta's solar PV value chain? And that's everything associated with deployment of 3.2 gigawatts is $4.1 billion. And that's rooftop plus ground rent, all together. Okay, now what we've done is we've broken it down by life stage. So similar to before, we've got manufacturing now 57%. We have design at 7%, development 13, O&M at 7, installation at 17. But that's out of 4.1 billion. So manufacturing then is 2.3 billion. Design 297 or 294 million, development 519, installation 701, so 0.7 billion dollars for installation. So those are big numbers. Those are interesting numbers. But that's how it's divided by life stage. And then you say, okay, well, how much is in ground mount and how much is in the rooftop? So here's the breakdown, both on the capital expenditures, O&M. Rooftop, ground mount, and then the total. So most of it is in the ground mount, and most of it is in the capital expenditures from ground mount. So you can see that the majority of the value is in ground mount, and rooftop is about one third that of the ground mount. Now the number of installations, however, you can see the number of installations for rooftop is 96,000. That's a lot of install. Um, whereas ground mount, we assumed around 100 megawatts. We have a question. Does this figure include financing costs at all? No, so financing was not included. Yeah. So that's also something else to yeah. consider. Right? Yeah. And this is also only domestic Alberta demand. It's not global demand, it's not exports or anything like that. This is all it is. The other question we were asked is like, well, where is the solar going to be deployed? It will be deployed where it's sunny, and <laughs> all of them are sunny, but where in Alberta? So on the rooftop installs, we actually did some work on how many rooftops there are in each of the cities. And uh, so I've just shown a little map on the side just to sort of show the solar resource. So uh, Calgary will actually have the most number if you are deploying on 12%, and it's only because we have more buildings, uh, more rooftops. Um, and you can see that the solar resource difference, it's actually not that different between Edmonton and say, Medicine Hat or, or Lethbridge. It, it's really maybe 10% difference. And the worst solar site in Alberta would be way better than any solar site in Germany. Or New Jersey. Um, that I can, so it's, it's not a question of the resource. I was on a, the Alberta Power Summit uh, panel um, and I was there, I was talking with somebody, and they had a, a map similar to this, and they put down, they said it's good solar, and then they had up at the top of Alberta, poor solar. But no, it's, it's not poor solar, it's just slightly less good. <laughs> and then in terms of the, the ground mount installations, they're typically going to be within about 10 kilometers of any sort of distribution or substation or transmission lines. Oh, we have a question of fact, but you have to come down to the mic. 
so cell manufacturing, possibly unit assembly, and that's because the Pacific Northwest is so close to us, and there's so much already built in the value chain today that it would be very difficult for Alberta to now start to compete from the manufacturing base when they already have all that infrastructure set up there. It's also a very global business, and very cost effective. As you can see, an 86% decline in cost over the time period is mostly in the manufacturing on the, on the solar margin side. So um, it was very hard for us to come in now with a, possibly a higher base. But there's a lot of other opportunities. So we, we looked at item number two, which is Alberta's growth opportunity. We said, where can we grow? What can we do? And it's really about uh, development and design. Our oil and gas sector does development every day of the week. And all of the same components are associated with that. And when I went, to, when I was at Suncor and I was working and I, I started their renewable energy group back in 1999. And I actually brought over all of these people with the same skills that brought them into wind at the time to do development work. And it's a lot of it's stakeholder consultation, um, the landman, uh, communication, um, regulatory permitting, interconnection, civil works, road design, etc. Same thing on the solar side. We have a lot of skills that we can pull people in from the established oil and gas space and bring it in on the solar side. So this opportunity value we have on $537 million. We see it in legal, finance, commercial, technical advisors, site and system design. Each of those that I've listed there are over $100 million each. So that's pretty worthwhile. On the manufacturing side, we see an opportunity, but not in those particular aspects, but in the balance of system and, uh, and mounting systems, so racking, etc. So pipe racking, we do pipe racking today. Can we do solar racking? Absolutely. We already have a pilot company here in Alberta. So what are the opportunities here? This requires more of a deep dive so that we can understand what can we do in Alberta. But it does require us to have some friendly policies for manufacturing in Alberta and also some transition policies for employers to transition um, personnel over from one sector to this sector in order to help alleviate the cost in the training. And then also then on installation, so a lot of it is on the electrical works, and frankly, a large portion of that is an area we can definitely grow into. We just need more companies, we need more people, we need more capacity. Um, the next chart definitely looks a bit complicated, but again, when you have it at 11 by 17, you don't see all the details. But what we've done is we've overlaid the, the three different buckets of Alberta's current capacity, Alberta's growth opportunity value and the external value. Then we've overlaid them with the light stage, and then we find each value component and put the size of the pie as to the size and the value in it. And so we've got all of these mapped out in the report. And essentially in manufacturing, if you look in the red, that's your growth opportunity. It's in the manufacturing sector, and it's in, I don't know, <laughs> system and, and that's where a lot of the value is. Now this is again only Alberta domestic demand. If, if we can access other markets that are growing so fast, then this, is, this becomes much bigger. So again, significant value associated with manufacturing, converters, metering systems, transformers, miners, optimizers, collection lines, etc. We need to do, we need to do a study on this one. So I mean, somebody who's got a very strong manufacturing base and understands it's got good relationships with manufacturing systems in Alberta. Um, on the R&D side, again, on the material science, this, is, this space is moving so quickly that we believe that we need to continue to focus on uh, emerging technologies. So both on material science and nanotechnology, as well as on the energy storage side. And both U C and U of A are already in these areas, and we think you know, keep watching the space, keep investing in the space. And I'm an engineer, and I think that the undergraduate level engineers need to have options that are available in both energy storage and material science so that they can at least get exposed to these areas, because this is the energy of the future. In terms of export opportunities, with a global rate of 20% per year growth internationally, um, we need to also look at export, but we need to actually know what we're doing before we can export services and products. We didn't do this in the report, but again, I think in a couple of years' time, it would be a good idea to do something about this. But in the meantime, we really need a stable solar PV market in Alberta, 
to develop these services and skills and expertise that we can then start to export. So the next question is about jobs, and we actually had a lot of fun pulling together a list of all the jobs that there is in Seoul. And um, there's a lot. There's over 60 different types of jobs, and uh, the report has them all listed, so you don't have to take a picture of this. <laughs> Um, but they're really quite diverse, everything from IT, land, marketing, legal, finance, materials, science, all the way through in the entire value chain. And here's just a few that I've thrown in here as a sample. And we put them into the different life stages as well. So there's a lot of jobs. In the US, it tends to be a little more mature with regard to the job descriptions and definitions of each role. And we actually looked at a lot of those and pulled them in to say, yeah, you know, I think these are Reasonable. Now the JEDI model uh, was used to identify, now that we know the value, and a lot of the model um, in terms of number of jobs is all based on what the value is, because it'll break down for each component then how many jobs, because uh, they will have the typical job salary for each kind of thing, and then identify how many jobs. So we did this work, um, and it ended up being around 9,800 jobs required by 2030. Now this is, you saw that deployment curve, so by 2030, that's the most number of people. And so that number is 9,800 jobs. There's a few different ways to represent jobs. Some they do it in FTE years or job year equivalents, and we can convert that. But essentially that's the peak would be 9,800 jobs that are in the solar sector. Most of it's in ground mount only because we have more ground mount deployment. Um, and what we've also done is we put it in by life stage. So you can see a lot of it is in um, manufacturing, construction, and installation. So it's more heavily weighted towards the number of jobs in that area. Now, those are all the jobs, but how many jobs have to be in Alberta for that much deployment? And the Jedi model provides us that answer, which is great. So it actually says that 58% of the jobs have to be in Alberta. So that's 5,600 jobs. That's roughly equivalent to our, our gas power um, Power generation in Alberta is around that number of jobs. So that's like, oh, that's actually pretty big. So you think 5,600. Mm -hmm. That's actually pretty big. So those are all the local people, local jobs that would, would be required for the 3.2 gigawatt deployment. The next thing we did is we looked at the training assessments, and uh, we found that most of the training is in the areas of designing solar and PV, mostly on rooftop. Uh, in installation and commissioning, and mostly on the residential areas of rooftop. There was a few other institutions that have some renewable energy elements, but not, not like a master's degree in renewable energy or anything like that. Like if you're in the UK or uh, Denmark or Germany, you can get a master's degree in renewable energy from different aspects. Some it's policy and regulation, some it's engineering, some it's on the social humanities side, etc. But here you have like maybe a course here or there. So here's a listing of nine solar rooftop training providers. There's a couple of them that are online, and then seven that are proper based. And then we've also put down what kind of certification they have, if it's NAVSEP, which is the North American, I like how the North stands for it, and then RCSA, which is the Canadian Science Association. So there's just a list, Safe is on here, um, hopefully we're well, right, and uh, we also have Nate on here as well. Um, but these are the, the training that's available. Then, more broadly speaking, we have, like McEwen University has Business 201, Introduction to Sustainable Business. It's not renewable energy, but it kind of touches a little bit. Um, the most sort of specific ones, oh, I really like the Lethbridge College, which had the Solar 101 for homeowners. I thought it was a great idea. Uh, some introductory ones. Um, Richard College has the Alternative Energy Lab, but we couldn't find anything in their curriculum for training. So I think. Maybe knock on the door and maybe team up with them. Um, then the University of Alberta has some graduate level courses, and the University of Calgary has some continuing ed as well as some graduate level courses. Not a lot on the undergraduate level. I think there is one I've heard of at the undergraduate level at the U of C, but not anything like it might sort of cover all renewable energy in several weeks and we're done. It's sort of at the, at the cursory level. So not a lot of robust um, training in renewable energy here in Alberta. Now, if you look at the oil and gas side, there seems to be a lot more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. So 
the, our conclusion on the training opportunities, and I know there was a question up there, and we'll get back to it, um, is that we have a lot of people with transferable skills, but they don't know about solar, or they don't know how to transition over to solar, and we don't really have any training to help them transition from their skill set over to get that expertise. Um, and the, the large-scale utility, we don't really have anything on large-scale utility deployment for solar or wind or renewable energy. Um, yes? Uh, I'd like to add something to the training part. The University of Calgary does have some uh, specialization in wind labs. I've uh, set up some equipment for them, and they are actually okay. doing some interesting research on it okay. for wind technology. And they do have a solar car, and yes. uh, they actually have some very advancements made there. Yes. And using how their solar technology there. So why don't we chat after, and I'll update my report. We, we look at solar car, I'm a big fan of the solar car, um, but is it a training course? And there's a lot of definition of is it a training course, is it for deployment, or is, is that just super cool? And, um, so some of it was like, where do, where do we go? But yeah, I'd love to have some updates on that. Um, but overall is we, we really don't have um, curriculum in Alberta set up to support us for a three gigawatt deployment of solar. We don't have it. Um, we have, we definitely have some foundational aspects for rooftop deployment for sure, and and that'll probably grow. Um, but we don't have anything on the utility scale, or and, and for wind, we have one training course in uh, Lethbridge. That's it, and that's at the technician level. So we, we're definitely short. Um, I heard uh, I was talking to somebody yesterday who the University of Guelph has um, a master's available in renewable energy. And I know at Ramuski they also have a master's level of wind, wind engineering. But there's very few across Canada for any kind of opportunities. I know people who have come from Alberta to the UK to get a master's in renewable energy to come back then and work in the oil and gas industry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of priorities, so when we looked at all of this, what we said is that we don't have enough people. We don't have enough people with the right skill sets in order to help deploy this. So we really need to increase our capacity in the conventional value chain contributions. So that's development, design, installation, all of those key areas. We don't have enough people, we don't have enough companies, we don't have enough employees in order to be able to do it. Second thing is we really like this whole balance of system manufacturing base. There's a lot of money there. There's a lot of money potentially in the export opportunity. And even if you're making one little widget that's on every solar module, the export opportunity is absolutely amazing. And why not make that one little widget? Even if it's only worth five cents, it's five cents multiplied by a gazillion is a lot of money. So the <laughs> idea is driving into these, these pieces of the solar um, the supply chain to be able to access it and say, let's take this one to Alberta and let's have Alberta have a piece of this. Um, and then the next one is this emerging technology. I know in the wind industry, GE issues a new turbine every 18 months. And in solar, it seems to be even shorter than that for new technology coming out. Um, and so we need to be on the cutting edge of what's happening with emerging technology. Uh, the Institute of Nanotechnology in Edmonton, we have um, a Center for Material Science for Solar in Calgary. And we also have energy storage in Calgary. But it's about not having them as, as only accessible to graduate level, but also bring it down to have people are more immersed in it. So that our engineers, our scientists are involved in these emerging areas. I know, uh, again, if you look sort of on the oil and gas side, there's so much opportunity there, but I think we need to expand and diversify and broaden our base into other, other training opportunities. So just to go through this, I think I already said this. So number one, increased capacity. We need more people. Also even legal, a lot of finance and legal. Finance is typically done out of Toronto, um, historically in the renewable energy sector. And a lot of the legal firms have a lot more experience on the solar out of Toronto because they've had the feed-in tariff in Ontario, and so they've had a lot more experience. Whereas the, the, only, uh, the legal in Alberta tends not to have as much experience. I have noticed though, I always notice when law firms start to sponsor conferences, it means they smell money. 
So I started to see that some of the conferences in Alberta on renewable energy are now sponsored by some law firms. So I'm thinking, hmm, that's interesting. But typically, it's on it's Ontario is is the hub for renewable energy in Canada at the moment. And I'd like to see, it used to be Alberta and then it's one moved to Ontario. I'd like to see some of that come back here. Uh, the next one's on the manufacturing base. I think I've talked about that already. And the third on the emerging technology. So next steps, we need to have more forums. We need to get more people involved and aware. Forums like this, seminars, conferences, networks. Uh, we also need to have a stable and predictable solar PV market. Knowing that there is deployment no matter what government is in power, that solar is part of the mix and it's here to stay. And frankly, the genie's out of the bottle. Solar's coming down so, so fast uh, in price that it's going to be part of the mix. But to have, I was saying to somebody the other day, that when I look at my cell phone, I don't say it's an NDP policy cell phone or it's a UCP <laughs> policy cell phone. It's a cell phone. <laughs> Same thing with solar. It's just solar. It's not one party or another party. It's just technology that is part of our energy mix and part of the future. And so we need to sort of peel away those layers of this political glue that sticks on these things. And it's, it, it really needs to be on its own. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's my little my <laughs> drum. Um, we do need to advance our knowledge because internationally this sector is growing so fast that if Alberta does not have exposure to it, then we can't capture part of the value that's happening globally. Um, again, on the manufacturing, I really think we need to study on it. And then the next part is there's a lot of myths out there about solar. And there's pros and cons to solar, but let's talk about real ones and not pretend ones. And so it means that politicians, decision makers, People need to know about the real aspects of solar. And I think CISA is very powerful in bringing that to everybody. So I really appreciate that. Um, but we also need to bring people over in terms of, I, I had a job ad, I was telling you about it earlier. Um, I had 160 people apply for a project manager job. In there I said the prerequisite, you needed eight to 10 years of renewable energy experience. I had 160 apply, I had 10 qualified. Most of them are oil and gas, most of them in pipelines, all of them shipped over. And if you look at their resumes, they're all qualified, with the exception of they don't have the renewable energy experience. But they have the skill base, and so the idea is, how do we bring these people over into this industry, provide them the exposure, provide them the experience? Like for me to take somebody on like that versus somebody with renewable energy experience, it's going to take me a hit financially in my company to bring them on. So, I mean, if those programs or policies to help retrain so that they're it's a lower burden to the uh, developer or the investor, et cetera, that might be a, a better way to sort of bring more people into the sector. Uh, the other thing is typically oil and gas pays a little better as well as the other. <laughs> um, then again, as I mentioned on the engineering side of things, I really am passionate about making sure that we know and our engineers that are graduating are aware of these industries, have uh, the opportunity. I know at the University of Calgary and the chemical engineer, they have a a biomechanical engineering side which offers these students fantastic opportunities. We need to offer them something in the renewable energy side as well. So overall, in conclusions is worldwide, it's one of the fastest growing technologies for power generation. We have the opportunity to be part of the global industry. This could be worth over four billion, of which Albertans could achieve three billion of it. Um, we can increase that by going into export opportunities, but we need to act now so that this and I was, I, was, I was looking for sort of the final slide, and I was working with my son, who's 14, and it was all on, um, uh, do you remember Roadrunner and Wiley e. Coyote? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I feel like the solar industry is like the Roadrunner, and it's going so fast, and we need to catch it. But the only problem was any animations I could see was Coyote, like, setting fire to itself, and things like that, so I thought, no, that's not the right visual. <laughs> but we have to capture this Roadrunner. We have to catch part of this rather than waiting and watching this entire industry walk by. Is we need to be a part of it and we need to be a significant part of it. And we have such talent in Alberta that it's time that we sort of start opening yourself up, grow our own market, but also look at export opportunities. Is there any questions? Uh, before I ask my question, I just want to say thank you. That was a very enlightening uh, talk. Thank you. Now, with respect to the question early on in the conversation,
conversation, there was a question about pricing. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to expand on that a little bit. And, and the two parts I want to ask is that in your earlier assumptions about um, Alberta responding like the U.S. market has, how did you deal with the fact that the U.S. market has been stimulated by public policy subsidies that has generated that growth and, and Canada generally doesn't? Agreed. Uh, so that was, that was a tricky part. I mean, it's that not all states have policies at all. And so we saw that as a damping. So you had damping effects from some states, and then you had accelerating effects from other states. And so we looked at it overall, and we figured that let's, you know, in the study that we did previously, we actually did five scenarios as to say, how big is this? For this one, we chose the one that we feel is a bit more representative. It's called Scenario E. And this one was the one that's non-linear. Um, so we felt it was representative. Is this science? No, it's a little bit of art. Um, but we felt it was a reasonable assumption based on what's happened in the US overall. It's not a California one, but it, 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 you know, it's not a Texas one. Uh, thank you for that. So the second part of that question is, in your projections about uh, act future activity in Florida, what assumptions did you make in terms of uh, government subsidies? So it was not a economically based deployment. It was based on what could it be. Um, so what we did is we looked at, so we essentially had those five segments and each one grew at a certain rate because, um, let me back up a second. You have the potential. So how many, how many rooftops do we actually have? And how many could we actually stick stuff on? So you start with that, say, okay, that's interesting. But how do, I can't get there right away. And I can't have you know, 30 people do all of this. So how fast can I actually grow? And those deployment rates on how fast an industry can grow and can mature were all based from the US historical. And so we said, okay, what do we have in Alberta? So that was our base. And then we grew it at the rate that the US has grown. Yes, there's been policies and policies start and then they stop, but we took historical average and said, okay, that's the growth rate that it has on a year-over-year basis. But we start with this lean base. And then we had difficulty on the community one because we, at the time, Brooks Solar had just gone and say, okay, well, what's our base? And we said, our base is 15 megawatts. And then we grow it from there. Um, and that one had more, uh, at most uncertainty. On the utility scale, we, we looked at, uh, of course, we have no utility scale here. So we assumed that start with 100 megawatts. And let's start in this time frame. Now let's look at the overall U.S. deployment rates. Um, so there's another study that's about 70 pages long that goes into all of those details. Okay. And my my, um, my final question, I promise, is uh, <laughs> I, I wouldn't have asked that question because there's no one standing behind me. No, <laughs> so so how does in your study how did uh, issues around carbon pricing or carbon taxes play into your so economics did not play. No, no okay. it's just saying, hey, the U.S. has grown at this rate. Let's start to grow ours at this rate. We don't look at um, any kind of economics. All we said is that the deployment, the costs have come down. They will continue to come down. Therefore, is it reasonable to look at the U.S. historical deployment rate as where we were? And, and frankly, if you go back about 11 years, that's where Alberta is today is where the U.S. was in terms of the capacitance um, the difficulties in getting people who actually knew what they're talking about, um, the number of businesses that were involved, we're about 11 years behind is what we could see from a, a capacity potential. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, great. Uh, thank you for attending once again. Uh, so I have just a quick question. In your uh, slides, you have given an assumption that Alberta is as comparable in solar, this thing as Rio de Janeiro or Miami. Yeah. So what is the basic like I mean, quality or did you take the factors that consideration of snow we had get for the So we're, we're around kind of four I mean, depending on the technology, we're about fourteen hundred megawatt hours per megawatt approximately. Um, and if you look on the same space or any radius, you'll see it's around the same. Now we get most of ours in the summertime and uh, and not so much in the winter, whereas other areas they'll still have the same average, but they get most of it sort of on a daily basis. Yeah. So, for example, in um, a lot of people talk about a duck curve in California. I don't know if you guys know about the duck curve in California, where the solar comes off quickly and then <coughs> the generation has to ramp up really quickly. So, 
But we have also did a study for Alberta, will we have Dunkirk? And the answer is no. And why is that? Two reasons. One, uh, in the summertime, what time is our sunset? Um, or later. And how many of us have air conditioning? Yeah. So that, that's why we don't, we're not going to get that. So ours is more seasonally oriented versus more steady. But if you're in California in the summertime, you know, sun down, eight o'clock sort of thing. Yeah. Well, is, is part of the answer to this gentleman's question too, in terms of where the uh, comparative data comes from that puts us comparable to Rio, for example, it's actually measured data, right? Where we oh, this is all typical mean year data. So Environment Canada and Enercan, uh, this is all data. Now we don't have a lot of actual data stations in Alberta. Um, we have three, and those have got long-term data sets, and those are used then to assess all the resources. But anything in between those three is really an interpolation of what it is. Um, but look at any of the solar maps, Enercan, Environment Canada, um, also go on to NREL, they also will look at that and you can see that. So the production profile is different, but the average is the same. And again, we don't have those high temperature uh, degradation in the production profile. Our, I think our average for Calgary is 4 degrees Celsius. <laughs> I work with guys out of Georgia and they just shake their heads like, 